Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining tonight's session. My name's Taylor with Football Alberta. If I haven't uh, met you guys yet, uh, I guess through this video session or even uh, in person. So I just wanted to say hi and, and thank you very much for joining the session tonight. It's focused on six aside football and, and uh, how to coach it, what the rules are, what are the major differences. I want to just kind of walk through a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Uh, if we could, if we could just keep our uh, mute button on, uh, unless we're going to be asking questions. And then uh, also with your video, I don't believe there's any need to have video on unless you want to jump on and, and talk to Corey and maybe ask him a question. But what we're going to do is um, I'll put my phone number in the chat bar if you guys want to send me a direct text message and just ask a question, or please use the chat bar uh, within the, the Zoom app here. You can either just say the question to everybody or you can just directly message it to taylor as the host so um corey can join us if you want there corey uh, uh, pop your video on and say hi i usually at the beginning uh provide an update of what's going on with football and 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 where we're at since there's about 40 of us tonight and we can kind of give corey an idea of where you're coming from and what your six aside experience is is uh write your maybe your school or your team name, like what organization you're part of in the chat. And if you're like a newbie, just write newbie or uh, a vet in terms of like six aside football. It might give Corey an idea of, of where we're at. If we're talking to maybe some people who have experience, he can get more detailed. And if it's brand new people, then uh, he knows accordingly. So why don't you guys all just kind of just say where you're from, you know, I'm from Ladue. Uh, just in the chat bar there, I'm from Leduc and I have no experience with Six Disciple Hall. Just something like that, if you could, please. So uh, anybody who kind of pops on with the video, I am unfortunately just going to turn your video off. But just a quick, where are you from and if you have any experience, and I'll give Corey some time to, to read through those. So while you're doing that, I will provide an update on what we know, the, the, the state of football in Alberta as we know it. Um, Premier Kenny spoke today. He rolled out his plan with tentative dates, but football wasn't in it and sports wasn't really in it. It was maybe in the phase three with, um, you know, no dates attached to it at all. So we don't necessarily have any new updates at all when it comes to football, but our executive director, Tim Anger, did speak to the minister of sport today and uh, each provincial sport organization has been tasked with coming uh, coming up with their their phased in approach, their their new uh, their new football and what that looks like, based on the uh, numbers that may be allowed. If it's 50 or if it's 100 or if it's 250, so we need to have a step by step approach of how we're going to enter back into this football world. So our board of directors are meeting on Monday night. We're going to kind of come up with our plan for the future of football, whether that looks like for June, July, August, September. We're going to roll that out. It goes to the minister's office and then the minister will meet with Alberta Health Services and they'll kind of give us more details as we go. It probably will be a phased in approach of maybe we can have camps and maybe some small group skills and drills. Some sports will be allowed. Outdoor sports may be allowed. Indoor sports won't be. So long story short, no update. We're hoping to play football soon. Uh, we're here with Corey tonight to take our minds off everything else around us for maybe an hour, hour and a half. Feel free to ask questions in the chat bar on the side and I'll interrupt Corey as we go. Or if you just wanna say, I have a question and you really wanna just pop your video on and ask him, we can do that as well. So um, I guess Corey, uh, Breton High School. He's been there for 20 years as a, a teacher. He's had a football program for 15 seasons since 2005. He's been to involved with Six Aside football for 15 years. He's one of the most experienced coaches in Six Aside in the province, along with a few other guys who I see one or two on the list today. So, you know, Corey, at any time, if you want to invite some other people to come on and, and chat about it, or whether it's Cam or uh, some of the other guys on the list that I see, Chuck or whatever, feel free to converse how you want. So thank you very much. And Corey, it's all yours, buddy. Cool. Well, uh, welcome, guys. I see we've got quite a mix mix of guys. We've got some of the guys from the league that are here and a pile of people that are 
uh, brand new and just checking it out. We've got some Adam guys here, so which is good. I'll try and give you guys as much information as possible as well. And I'm going to try and um, share my knowledge with you. Share my screen right now. So, you're good there, Corey. You're, uh, okay, you're good. PowerPoint. Yeah, good to go. Excellent. Okay, so I have been, like Taylor says, I've been coaching six man football for 15 years in Breton. Um, I started the first, first team in the kind of resurgence of six man football here in Alberta. Um, I'm one of the few guys I never played a snap of 12 man football. I grew up in Saskatchewan and so I've never, never played 12 men at all. I have coached it, never played it. Um, uh, I am currently the offensive line coach for the U16 team, Alberta 12 men. So I have been, I have been coaching at, the, at that level as well too. So today guys, I'm going to try and uh, hopefully give some of the guys who know some stuff about football, some, some different ideas and some things that I do. And some of you new guys, especially the Adam guys, give you some ideas, maybe add some creative flair because six-man football is an offensive game and it's a wonderfully fun fun version of the game to play. Also, with uh, I know everybody in, in sport is struggling to get kids out, trying to keep a program alive and keep a program going. Six-man football and hopefully nine-man football in Alberta, these are viable options to keep guys playing playing the game. So, and I'm, I'm hoping, guys, today this version is going to sell itself. It's an exciting, fun version of, of, of football. Um, my problem with 12-man with football, especially at the younger ages, is kids get pigeonholed into one position, and they are they're one growth spurt away from going from an offensive guard to a six-foot-four wide receiver. And, but if they don't know the, sk the skill set of the other position – they're, they're in tough. And I see that when we're at the, the U16 tryouts. We've got kids trying out at guard and tackle that are now way too long and lean to play the position. But this is the skills they know, so that's the position they try out. Six-man football is not new. Like I, For example, I played six-man football. The program I grew up in is over 50 years old. Saskatchewan had, I think, 45 teams last year, and I know Texas – ranks their top 200 six-man teams across the state every every week so the rules the rules we try and keep very similar to 12 men to keep it as um as stra straightforward as possible the timing as you can see is exactly the same as 12 men okay we go four 48 minute quarters okay with the stop time in the last three minutes Okay, we don't change anything. Our field size, coming from the American game, it's, it's kind of different. It's 40 yards wide by 100 or 110 yards long, depending on what field we're playing on. If we're playing on a turf field, 12 men, we go 110 yards. Our end zones, though, are only 10 yards deep. And hash marks are 15 yards in from the sidelines. If we're playing on a 12-man field, we usually play to the insides of the numbers. It makes it a little more crowded than what we're used to. As an offensive guy, I prefer to have the more space, but that's what we usually do on a 12-man turf field. And we do that every year for our provincial championships. Conversions in 12-man football are reverse, or sorry, six-man football are reverse from 12. Kick, kick conversions are worth two points. Run or pass are worth one point. And the reason for this will be very obvious when I show you guys the clip of how narrow your line is blocking, trying to block for a field goal. Okay, your, your center, your holder, your kicker have to be one quick unit in order to get it off. So it's worth two points. Only the middle of the three players in the line of scrimmage is ineligible each play. Okay, now this is the point where a lot of 12-man guys really struggle with, especially offensive coordinators when they're coming to create a new playbook or 12-man co or defensive coordinators struggle recognizing it okay whoever's in the middle of the line of scrimmage is ineligible that does not have to be your center and i will show you a whole pile of clips here where we offset the line and make the center eligible 
Okay, all three players on the line of scrimmage must be set for a second before the ball is snapped. That's to give the defense a chance to read who's the ineligible and who are eligible receivers. We don't allow cut blocks at six-man football. Um, we use an ASAA football. And that's come up with just confusion over different teams about what ball to use. In all other ways, six-man football follows the rules for 12 men because we want to give the kids as a close to an experience of six-man football or 12-man football as possible with our game. So we keep the rules as similar as possible. Okay, and again, if you have any questions about that, about the rules, as we go along, make sure you text Taylor and let him know. So selling the game. So I've got some fun, guys. These are just some clips of some different, different game footage. Of course, my system will take it a second to load. but So this is my center. So again, what I'm talking about, we have an offset line here, guys. Both my tight ends are off to the side. So instead of the center being ineligible, we have one of my tight ends is now the ineligible receiver. And yes, the, I'm sure 12 men guys are going to panic over this gap. It makes everybody worry. But this is a lot of fun because my center likes to score touchdowns. I'm sure all of your centers do. Again, in case you want to keep an eye on the center, guys. He's not, he wasn't the greatest route runner this center. He graduated a year ago for me. Uh, oops. So we do have the hard open field hits that Everybody loves about football. So for this one, keep an eye on my middle linebacker. Here he's going to pop this kid from Hannah. Beautiful tackle, nice play. I'll run that again for defensive players. Defensive coaches love to hear that sound. And just so you know, guys, kids do have the opportunity to go play this next level at a six-man. That 32, that middle linebacker, was in the process of, of going to the Wildcats camp when we all got shut down because of COVID. So this will make all offensive linemen happy. This is a play by Caroline. They even find a way to get their big men. Oops. They're big men the ball. So this is their a spread play. Keep an eye on the big boy here. It's a big tackle by my guy to step up and take that hit. <laughs> Six men is an offensive game. Think of it more like basketball than low scoring NFL football. Back Hannah and I, two was it two years ago, had a playoff game that finished 96-92. So these are big play games. It's an exciting game, guys, because you're never out of it. Big plays happen quickly, okay? You never ha not have a chance to score. One missed tackle by the defense, one good block by the offensive players, and away you are the races. So here, this is a field goal. You can see how quick your center, come on. Oh. So your center, your holder, and your kicker have to be. For some reason, it won't play again, guys. Sorry. Ah. And a little razzle-dazzle. Six-man football has a lot of trick plays. They're not once-in-a-blue-moon kind of thing. These are 
plays that most offenses pull off on a regular basis. <laughs> Unfortunately, my quarterback drops it. But you can see it's one of the best views I have of this play. So anybody can catch a pass. Anybody can throw a pass if it's designed right. And, of course, everybody gets to run the ball. So this is a reverse. So keep an eye on Big 85 here. Again, I'll let you see that again. So what's happening is our running back's coming. He's taking the handoff. It's looking like one of our base plays. And instead of running a sweep to the outside, he's going to hand it off to 85 here. Okay, so guys, six-man football. And again, I'm just a little introduction, a little fun with the, vi the video here to begin with. The, you can, almost anything you can just draw up for an offense, you can probably pull it off in some way, okay? Every guy in my team gets a chance to score touchdowns, running, receiving. I will show a play where my, my center actually runs the ball, okay, later on. But it's, it's an exciting game for the offense. It is a great game for the defense because every guy has to be involved in every play. There's no taking a play off because it's not going my direction. Or, you know what, you can just hide a guy. It's tough to hide a guy in a six-man field. Hey, Corey, so yes. go, go back to that slide there, bud. Uh, okay. I, don't, I don't think you did the zone coverage one, but maybe you did. Oh. Uh, there no, is – okay, play that one, and then uh, we do have a couple quick questions. Okay. Yep. Again, this is just the introduction video, just showing some – having some fun. I got actually other stuff planned later. So – you can run man or zone. So this is a nice nice zone pickup of my guys as they're transferring people. My outside linebacker here sliding across. So on defense, zone does work. Oh, of course, it stopped now. So I'll do it again. Again, and, again uh, that's 32, guys, the one that's headed to the Wildcats. Nice. And, Corey, uh, one of the questions was um, how do the rules differ when we're talking maybe high school to, like, U10 Adam? And we won't talk about that too much right now, but I know there's a few Adam coaches who are on the line who may be near the, near the end of it. I know, like, Edmonton, as an example, they have a, a modified rules, much different than high school. But – we can probably talk about that later on. That was one question, which we don't need to address now, but we'll okay. save it. Uh, but also, what are you, what's a typical roster size was one of the questions. Uh, I run usually run about 20 guys, I'm, but I'm, I'm the oddity. I'm, I'm the smallest school in Alberta playing, playing football of any kind. I only have 62 kids in my high school last year this year, but I run about 20 kids. What's an, um, average? What's an average for the other medium? They're usually sports? running yeah, 15, 16, 17. We've, we've seen a few schools go down as low as 12 and keep playing. And, but but I, run, I run about 20. Some of the big programs that have gotten 25. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So practice planning. Big difference between six or 12 men and six men is the lack of individual time because of the lack of coaches. I usually coach with myself and one other guy, and I know most of the other teams – except for Hannah, who is spoiled, which has, seems to have 25 coaches. <laughs> um, most of us run with two or three coaches. So you, the practice planning changes. I mean, I, I've, I've 
coached with the 12 men practices and I've, I've seen their practice plans. They, um, they, they plan in a lot of individual time. We don't have that because we don't have the coaches to take guys to plan individually. On top of that, none of the kids skills are as position specific in, in six men as they are in 12 men. So the kids learn, have to learn a wide variety of positions. Like for example, an outside linebacker, at one play he can be playing he can be playing D, a full DB DB position. He can be an outside linebacker. Um, your your center, okay, has to run block. He has to pass block. He catches balls. In my playbook, he can run the balls too. Everybody has to run block and catch. So there all there's no. Our kids are never coming out of out of out of the game as specifically detail trained as kids in twelve men, but they're they're football players, and they learn how to do do a wide variety of skills and, and can play ball. And one of the biggest compliments I've heard our six our twelve men sorry our six men defensive players know how to tackle in space because they have to do it all the time. They're men on an island all the time. So when I'm planning practice, guys, practice is actually more like a hockey practice than it is a football practice. And you'll see when I show you my, my um, practice plan, how I work them, they're designed more like a hockey practice than they are a football practice, just because of number of players, number of coaches, okay, and the different ways. So when I plan a practice, we do a lot of skills, catching, throwing, blocking, tackling. We rep this stuff constantly. We rep it together. Okay, a lot of guys end up playing both ways. So we do a lot of even our catching and tackling uh, reps together as a group because everybody ends up having to do it once in a while. The more skills they develop, the deeper your depth chart. And again, when you're running with 12 guys, you need everybody to know everything. Okay, and even my, my, my school with 20 players, out of my 20 players, three of them may be grade nines. So I need those grade nines to catch up quick. My philosophy is there's no such thing as an unathletic kid, just untrained. Okay, they can all get better at something if you keep training them. We spend a lot of time on footwork ladders, speeding their feet up, passing, passing routes, linebacker footwork, D-line footwork. Okay, we do a lot of this stuff. We do a lot of it together, or at least offense, defense. Half the team is doing it. We have a, a drill called hands drill where my quarterbacks and receivers are getting in a ton of catches and throws. And it's a repetitive dr drill that they do. Um, and it, it makes sure my guys catch 20 to 25 passes in a practice during the week. And then we'll do that about twice a week. For, we practice game situations. So we, and I we practice it in reverse order. Okay, so we, we learn. We go from a decision they have to make, okay, to the, um, the decision, the skill. Uh, I can't remember what it, oh, shoot. Sorry. Can everybody see that or is this thing down here blocking the bottom of the screen? I don't know. So do you plan practice in reverse? Yeah, we can't quite see it. Ah, shoot, sorry. Can you move that? So you might be able to drag it up to the top or down. No, that's not moving for me. You might have to be out of presentation. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Anyway. Anyway, I always plan my skills in reverse. So I think I think of a place where they have to make a decision. Okay, and then I go back to the skills they need to do that. The footwork, okay, the read, the cut, the read, the skill. Defensive, defensive guys go the tackle, the recognition of the play, the skill they need. And I teach it in that order. So when I plan the practice, we start with the skill, we, we do the read, then we practice the play. So with that, this is a blank practice sheet for me. Okay, it's pretty simple. And again, it's it looks more like a hockey practice plan sheet than, than a football one. I've got what I'm doing for early out skills, warm up, and then I've got the time, 
what I'm doing for a drill and I have a place to draw it for the kids. And the reason why I have a place to draw it is because I post this before practice so my kids can see what they're working on. And most importantly, as you, as you will see, um, the skills that I want them to develop in that. Okay, the outcomes that I want them to get from there. So here's a copy of a filled out one. And yes, I do practice from 7 to 8 in the morning every day. In Breton, we've decided that kids either will choose work over, over playing football, so we practice before school because nobody has to go to work that early. Okay, so we, this, on this today, we started out with a hands drill, which is a, the quarterback's throwing it, the guy's coming out of a line, straight at them, across, over the shoulder, and they go through the same repetition. The quarterbacks get a whole pile of throws and get warmed up, and everybody gets their hands warmed up. Then we have a warm-up. So they, they do two laps. We stretch. Now, we, when we stretch, we stretch. In Breton, we stretch in a big circle. Okay? And again, 20 guys isn't that big of a circle, which is something that we do, adapted, for, to, uh, changed from 12 men because, of course, we don't have as many guys. Then we always have some sort of a footwork kind of cardio exercise coming out of the, out of the stretch. So back pedal, flip the hips, and then stance and start. So they, they start in whatever – Stance is to their position, and then we do 5, 10, and 15-yard sprints. And if they play more than one position, they will change, pick a different, uh, different stance to start from. So if they're running backs or linebackers or they're tight ends or they're centers, they're all starting from whatever, however they start. So here's an example, guys, of what I'm talking about. So at 7, 10, I've got my QBs, running back centers. We've got some mesh time, and then I've written down what I want them to work on in that, in that section. So their kids are reading this as they go out right before practice so they can see, okay, that's the things coach wants us to work, concentrate on today. And it changes. We may do the same drill and they're concentrated on different things. I try not to put more than two things at a time because they are high school boys and it's seven in the morning and if I'm listing three or four things, a lot of them just get confused and forget what they're doing. So the defense is doing the same thing. You notice there's no tight ends in this. Because, of course, they have to run the ball as well. I'll, I'll use them as running backs as well, too, if I haven't got something else specific for them to work on. So then 720, we've got, I've got my QBs doing something separate. My offense and defense, again, so you can see where um, limited number of coaches means limited number of groups. Okay, so the defense working on blocking, uh, shedding blocks. And because we're working towards a run, a run play today, the run block progression for my offensive guys, that are, the quarterbacks are working on their own. And again, I'll pop back and forth between these two groups and my defensive coach will be working with these guys. Okay, so I'm hopping back and forth and my older guys do a lot of, a lot of coaching, a lot of reinforcing and a lot of maintaining of the, the standard for the team. Okay, and once in a while I got to get on them guys, but I'm fortunate enough, I've got some guys who are pretty serious about football, so they keep the standard pretty high. Okay, so then we, we go from our run bl blocking drill to a basic run, run sweep. So I'll have my center, quarterback, one, one running back, and somebody on the other side blocking versus one defender. And basically, I just want, the, I want the, the blocker to go out and take on the defender. The defender is just trying to maintain his gap, whether he's going inside or outside. And the running back's reading that block and making the cut. I'm not expecting the defensive player when it's two-on-one -on -one to make a tackle. I'm expecting him to fill his gap. Okay? And later on, I would add a second defender. Um, if this is early in the week, I might make it full tackle. Later on in the week, I go, I go to grab the, grab the hips, two-hand tag them. Um, I've always, yeah, I've always got them just to grab, two-hand tag them. From one of the sessions, I... Somebody brought the idea of getting the guys to put both hands on the hips. I love that idea. I'm going to use that next year. Okay, and then so I go. We've done a little bit of a kind of a half version of our, our run play. Then I go to some special team circuit. Okay, and this is a circuit I use quite often. So I've got my field goal group. They're with two edge rushers that are, are rushing to try and just block the kick. Okay, for my center holder and kicker, they're working on timing. So they're not trying to actually block it. They're just trying to read the snap, get by, working on their timing on the snap and getting and hurting hard. I've also got kickoffs. I got my kicker kicking 
doing kickoff, two gunners flying down following the ball, and one returner just trying to beat them. These guys, two, got two gunners just trying to maintain containment on this one guy. So basically with this drill, I've got 10 guys going at a time. Everybody except the kickers are rotating. The specific positions, the center, holder, kicker, and the kicker here, they're all rotating. So they're getting in sprints, short sprints, long sprints, long sprints. Okay, a little cardio mixed in with some angle of pursuit. And for my defensive guys watching the snap of the ball. And the last thing I always do is a little O versus D. So I, we work on series one run package. And I always make it a little competitive. So either we're doing so many first downs. The defense has three plays to get a first down. Or in this case, I went a best of seven. Four yards is the tipping point for six men. If the offense can get more than six, four yards each play, they're going to march down the field. If the defense can stop them in under four yards, the defense wins the play. And they do a best of seven, seven plays. Losing team has to carry in all of the water bottles and extra equipment that we, we have. So that's what a typical practice looks like for me. And again, I go from seven till eight in the morning. I know some of the, we go, my, my school, we go every day from seven till eight in the morning. My guys liked it. They liked the rhythm. I know some schools only go twice a week and they go a little longer, two hours, hour and a half. Um, I, my guys like to go every day. And they, they like that rhythm. They like focusing on football every day. Um, our school starts at 8.30, so I have to push them to get, to get into class on time. But that's what a typical practice looks like for, for us. Okay, so again, it's more like a hockey practice than it is a football, football practice because the individual skill time comes – we work on individual skills, but it's um, – Okay, guys, we're all going to work on defensive line skill today. Oh, we're all going to work on a linebacker skill today. And I tell them that. Okay, and if we're working, sometimes the off, if it's, I'm the only coach there that day because my other guy works in the oil field and sometimes he can't make it, sometimes I, I bring the offense over. Okay, guys, you guys are being the dummy for the, for the, um, the, dummy for the, for the defense today. So you're going half speed, and here's what they're working on. Let them work on it. Don't mess it up. And they do – they. The guys know pretty well that, okay, today's not my day to develop a skill. I'm here to help. And, again, that's the benefit of high school over Adam because my guys under, understand that need. The Adam might be a little, little bit different, okay, but, of course, you're probably going to have more coaches. You could get a couple of dads out there on their knees just being a, being a dummy instead because the dads will understand I'm trying to make the kid better, not beat him. I hope they would anyway. Okay, so – my presentation, guys, is really heavy on offense because I'm an offensive guy. I love this side of the ball, so I'm going to go through some the different offenses you have. I'm pretty sure Edmonton Minor Football, they have a prescribed offensive playbook, which, I, I mean, it's, it's good, but there's so much more you can open it up to, and I hope they let start when they move into Peewee, they let them open it up a little bit. So my offensive strategy, guys. Hey, Corey, I'm going to interrupt you for a sec. You want. Okay. Uh, someone had texted and brought up a good point. I think there's two things you could share right now. You're sharing your entire computer. You can okay. maybe just share, like if you go share, just share like this browser. So then it doesn't show everything at the bottom. Maybe like hit Chrome. Yeah. Maybe try that. And that, that should block things. There Did that go. work? Yep. So I'm just, okay. Yeah, or, and or you can put this in like PowerPoint mode where it just shows the actual slides themselves. Well, did that work? Am I just sharing the screen, the PowerPoint now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So on offense, six-man football is wonderful because you can draw up all sorts of weird and wonderful offenses because, again, you don't have to have five guys as ineligible receivers planted in front of the quarterback. So whatever you draw as an offense – or as a formation, it has to attack these six zones. Okay? So, if because if you come out in a formation and you never run the ball over here, or the ball never – the defense doesn't have to defend it. Now, not every play needs to attack all six, but this formation, when you walk out into it, you could hit any one of these six spots. Okay, and of course, they'd be a little bit shallower for 
I called it the first zone is just five yards deep behind the behind pass the line of scrimmage, and this is the rest of the way to the end of my quarterback's arm strength. Okay, but it, everybody, every play formation has to attack those six zones. If you don't create something that uh, – when a formation doesn't attack all six zones, it's way too predictable. Okay, so I'm going to show you now. Now my slide won't switch. There we go. Okay, so offense, there's been different offensive formations that different teams use in our league. So this is a three-man line. Okay. So this is Mill Woods, and they run the three-man line. They run traditional power stuff. They have a T formation, and they're running right up the middle behind that offensive line. So they, their guys are traditional uh, offensive line guys, and if you have this body type, th this is what you can go with. And again, your offense for six-man is very much predicted by what you have for body types. Okay, I very rarely have big offensive lineman types, so I run a bit different offense. But Millwoods runs that three-man three -man line, and they run – those three guys are traditionally just blockers, just like your center and guards are. Now, Rimby, on the other hand, likes to start in the three-man line, but they like to run three receivers out. So one of those tight ends – will be going out as a receiver a lot, and they're really good at it. So, so again, you get to see that that receiver, or that tight end release. Ah. Sorry, guys. I don't know why it's doing this this way. But. So, again, watch that near tight end. they got two receivers out here for my guys to worry about. And they're really good at releasing underneath here. So again, you're, if you've got somewhere kind of mid-range guys, they're, not, they're a little bit bigger, they're more tight ends than they are guards and tackles, you can run an offense similar to that. So Hannah likes to send out four receivers. So they start with a three-man line, but all four guys go out as receivers. So we got a wide receiver out here. Oops. I'll run that again, guys. Sorry, I missed. Touched my pad too many times. I know everybody's looking at that and going, why didn't my defensive ends just go and kill their quarterback? Hannah's quarterback was lightning fast, so we had to play him conservative. Okay, Hannah's L formation. So, again, you, whatever you can come up with, guys, you can draw it. But this is a three-man line with kind of an unusual running back set. And this creates – I'll let you guys have a look at it. So we, we just call this the Hannah L because you can obviously see why. Okay, but it caused some real headaches for our guys. Shifting and guys sliding underneath. And again, 32 saved us a bunch of times, so. So this is that same formation with, again, three receivers. So this looks a little bit more, but you can see, guys, Hannah's offset this line. The center's on the edge. So even in this tight formation, you can offset it and make your center an eligible receiver. Again, from that bunch, it's really hard for my guys to pick up who's open, who's, who's coming, who's not coming. Goodness, I don't know why that worked. Okay, but again, so you can run, if you're a 12 man guy and comfortable with a three man line, you can run something that's power, like a traditional guard and tackle, like Mill Woods does, 
Or you can, if you've got hybrid guys, you can start to send them out in different combinations. It's a lot of, a lot of fun. Now, some teams run a two-man line. The advantage of this, guys, is that it creates, it gives you a full-time wide receiver and still have your two running backs. It takes advantage of the space the six-man football provides. And if you've got a few extra athletes, So this is Brooks. So there's their two-man line. It's not offset. Their stand is ineligible. They've got two running backs or two guys in the backfield. And this guy's out as your standard starting on the line wide receiver. So again, it takes advantage of the spread option that six-man football provides. And again, see, you can, whatever you can draw for a formation, guys, you can have some fun with it. The two-man line, you can still run kind of the power game. The line, the extra guy out wide takes one of my linebackers out of the play. I don't know why he's given 10 yards depth, though. <laughs> so they're running a power game. Fortunately, number 44 for me is top eight in the province at 100 meters. He's a hell of a sprinter, so he can run down just about anything. But you can see they ran a straight fullback, running back. Even on a two-man, you can run your, run your power game. So this is a double option with the running backs. Okay, so they were setting us up for something later with this double option play, but it's a lot of fun that a double option, it works well. So that's the two-man line, guys, and again, spreading things out a little more, taking advantage of what, um, what six-man football provides as far as space, forcing defensive players to tackle in space. Okay, and again, if you have a bunch of thoroughbred resources, not a lot of size, Spreading things out is a wonderful idea. Okay, and so now we'll get into my spread offense. So I'm going to show you three formations that I use. This is series one for us. And again, we have nobody within five yards of the center. It's a balanced formation. Okay, because I do not have anybody that's the traditional offensive line shaped, shaped kids, or at least not enough. So I go this spread. So what I like about this formation, guys, is it creates blocking angles. These, those gaps between my center and my tight ends, okay, I'm inviting people to come through them because I'm creating blocking angles with it. So as you can see, my quarterback rolls. I'm creating blocking angles for my guys because they're waiting for the guy to come through. Nah. And my receiver, so much for my hands drill, how good it makes my guys. Huh. Okay, so this is our base play out of Series 1. This is what makes my offense click. So this is a basic sweep. So what happens, guys? This guy's coming across, get, getting the ball. We're sweeping to the side. We're leaving the backside guys to chase. Both my backside center and tight end, they're run, heading straight to the second level. This guy's responsibility is whatever comes through this gap here between him and the center. He's supposed to block that. And his, my running back's lead blocker is the other running back over here. Yeah. 
but it creates blocking angles, spreading things out. So this is the same play from the defensive perspective. This is us playing Peace River. But again, spreading things out creates that, those blocking angles. So I showed you that series one reverse. So we run the sweep, run the sweep. And then we have the backside option, which I already showed you guys. Again, this is that reverse 85 here. Again, we create those blocking angles. Everybody flows with the original sweep once we run it a few times. And we go up the backside. Again, being, every formation, being able to attack all six zones is really important. So being able to attack all six zones, you need to play up the middle. Okay, so this is a dive up the middle. Even under the spread, you can attack the middle. Try to show that again, guys, just because it happens pretty quick. So what's going to happen is my one running back and my center are going to split the gaps and open up that middle. So you can see my center and this running back are splitting the front two linemen, and my tight ends are going up picking up linebackers. They're headed to the second level. And because, of course, the tight ends are also receivers, their guys have to back off thinking pass coverage first. So, again, being able to attack all the zones. We have sweeps attacking left and right. We have a dive up the middle. And then we have, just for fun, a running back screen. I also run this screen with the tight end. So this is a screen play. This running back here, you're going to see get it. And I have four blockers on four blockers. Number one, Garrett Miller. And again, that, those gaps encourage teams to rush hard. My screen slows them down, and I have a wide variety of screens that I run. Okay? So that's my base, our, our base series one spread. This is series two. It's still a balanced formation. Okay, my tight ends are always lined up together on, on the wide side. My running backs are always on the narrow side. It's an offset formation, so my center is an eligible receiver. So this is the base play out of my Series 2. It is a power sweep. And again, guys, I'm showing you all these different formations to show just a wide variety of different formations that you can throw out there depending on your, what you've got for, for, um, for players, for body types. Okay? It's, you really do adjust your offense based on what you've got. And Brad and I started out with the, with the three-man line and didn't have the size to match with a bunch of schools, so I have morphed into this spread in order to survive and it's worked pretty well for us so this is a pass of that same formation so my quarterback rolls to his ineligible receiver for protection and then hits one of the other th one of the four receivers going out again the force them to cover four receivers including my center So again, guys, it's six-man football is it's exciting because every guy has a chance to catch a ball.
Okay, my center had six touchdowns last year. So that, how, that's exciting for some, some kid in Adam. Just catching a short pass, scoring a touchdown. His mom gets to cheer for him because she knows what that is. So here's another pass following the power sweep. And my grade 10 quarterback that year just about tried to make a throw further than his arm went. This is an unusual play for me because I very rarely give my quarterback that much protection. He likes that play. He thinks it's awesome. So this is a center pitch. So I said my center sometimes gets to run the ball. So that's a play you could incorporate if you've got a big, heavy kid at center. He gets the rumble for five yards, and he has a, has a blast. Now, I've changed this play, guys. This film, this film clip is actually two years old. I changed this play into a run-pass option. My quarterback is now reading this D-end, and he, if he can beat him, he'll roll out with the center coming across with him, putting that, that extra linebacker in a no-win situation. If he comes forward to stop my quarterback, we dump it over his head. If he stays back to cover the, quarter, cover the center, then we, the quarterback runs with it. Again, I can't stress enough, guys, how much fun six-man football is for everybody because it plays just like that. And this is that QB throwback I showed you guys earlier where my quarterback dropped it. But, again, it's everybody. You can have a variety of guys throw the ball. I had a play a couple years ago where actually my center threw the ball. He became, he became an eligible receiver, and then we – threw it back to him so he could throw the ball forward. And again, everybody needs to learn how to catch for six-man football. Okay, so my last formation I'm going to show you guys, oops, is my Series 4. There's no Series 3 because I keep changing it. I'm never happy with it. But Series 4 is my unbalanced formation. This is my quarterback. That's my center. Okay, it's unbalanced. So it throws another look at, at defenses, makes them shift. So this is my fullback sweep. So this play is actually supposed to be kind of a, a throw-off play because we're unbalanced. Most of our plays go to this side. Okay, but I need to be, have something in the formation to attack this side to keep the defense honest. So once in a while, I hand it off to my fullback to make sure somebody has to stay over there to, to stop him. And this play just turned out better than it should have because, unfortunately for Mel Woods, this kid's 240 pounds. This kid's 100 pounds. He did an admirable job trying to get in the way, but he didn't really want to be there. But again, you've got to be able to attack all the zones. So that's my play to attack this, this side. And for the most part, it usually gets stopped after one yard, two yards. Unless there's a huge mismatch but like that. But yeah, you have to be able to attack all the, all the, the, uh, the zones. This is the best play out, the, out of that formation. So again, we're doing that running back off, double option that Brooks did earlier. So we've got, we got the fullback option coming this way and the running back option coming up the middle. And a solid tackle by 99. He was Millwood's best player. He was an echo player. And then, of course, we still pass because we have to attack those deep zones too.
Let me see that one more time. Again, spread creates a nice blocking angles. So guys, again, for offense, it's anything you can draw up, okay, depending on what you've got for body types, it can work. Just make sure that when you're drawing it up, it attacks all six zones so you don't have a, a player formation that defense doesn't have to defend part of the field, okay? Six-man football is all about putting people in open space and giving your athletes a chance to beat somebody one-on-one -on -one or, your, or your defensive player to be able to stop somebody when he's trapped on an island all by himself. And anything you can draw, just make sure it, it covers, all of the, covers all the zones. Two-man line, three-man line, or my spread with a kind of a one-man line, anything you drop works. So offensively, it's a lot of fun. And like I said, I've had playoff games where there's more than 70 points scored. So six-man football is all about scoring the offense. Okay, so on, does anybody have any questions about offense before I move on to a little bit of defense? No, we're good, Taylor? Okay. So defense. You're, uh, you're, you're good, Corey. Um, there's just been, uh, I guess, some questions, probably from out of province, which is great, um, just about kind of how our 6 and 9 and 12 works. And I'll talk okay. to them and give you a little break. You can grab some water or whatever right now. Or just sure. Okay. Cool. Might as well just discuss um, with people who maybe are new to it or even out of province. But um, it varies across the province what our Adam level is doing and what our Kiwi level is doing. And the idea is for a gradual progression to 12 aside football. Um, so our Adam levels, some are playing six in like the Edmonton area. The Calgary area has a great, I think, nine aside league. Maybe it's 10. Um, and then Pee Wee is anywhere between nine and 12 aside. And then Bantam and High School is 12 aside. Corey's um, coming from a smaller high school. We also have an excellent six aside high school league, which is designed for uh, Corey, is it 125 population and lower? Is that right? Uh, high schools? Yeah, we, we, we let the, the three A schools play in our play in our provincials or play in our league, but not in the provincials. Yeah, so essentially, in our regular league. essentially it's for smaller rural high schools and yeah. uh, we've yeah. got anywhere from 18 teams now to what currently you have. Well, yeah, right now we've had, we've been at high at one point as 24. Now we're at 18. So that's specific and, just to, and that's specific just to high school. Later right. on in May, as I'm talking, we're having one that is a six aside specific to brand new grassroots football. And that's a total different beast than this because you're dealing with seven, eight, nine, ten year olds and how to coach it. Uh, and that one is on May 28th and it'll be designed for, you know, new dads and, and new football coaches who are interested in learning the six aside game at the grassroots level. For the most part, this conversation is for the high school uh, and, and, you know, maybe bantam programs that may have to run six aside. So um, the idea is gradual progression uh, with Adam being six, Pee Wee being nine, bantam in high school being 12, just to give the opportunity for, for kids to learn all positions, um, you know, all the benefits that Corey has talked about today. So that's kind of what we're running. Um, and we'll, we'll move on to, I think, the defensive side. We'll take more questions uh, in terms of any questions at the end of the presentation. So thanks for the questions in the chat and uh, keep them coming. And I see even some of the participants are chatting amongst themselves, which is good. So go ahead, Corey. Okay, cool. So I'm, my defensive stuff, guys, is not near as, de not near as detailed because um, I'm an offensive guy. Um, if you really want to talk some defense, I know uh, Bill Brownfield from Rimby is on here. Um, he's an excellent defensive coach. Con you could contact him and get more ideas, but I'm going to give you the basics, guys, of what I do for a defensive scheme. And again, it's very much getting guys to make open field tackles because they, they have to do it a lot. But it's so gap cancellation. One man, one gap. Do not expect a kid to be able to guard two gaps. Always know that under formation, whatever you're doing, who's in charge of containment and make sure your kids know down and distance. But when you're designing one, one guy, one gap, okay, if you're expecting a kid to be able to play two gaps, 
Okay, you're expecting too much out of a kid. Okay, and that actually, I learned that from well, at the Golden Bears, Golden Bears coaching clinic. Um, they had the defensive coordinator for the Eskimos in, and that was what he said at that level too. One man, one gap. Okay, so again, a three, you can run a three-three defense. If depending again, it depends on what you've got for bodies, what you've got for size. Okay, but predetermining gaps and who's responsible for what and who's responsible for containment. So in this formation, a 3-3 formation, you see you've got guys in charge of gaps. Okay, you've got two. The 3-3 three, three is nice because it gives you a chance at almost double containment. You've got the D end and the outside linebacker in charge of containment on both sides. Okay, it does make it hard, though, to do pass coverage because you have to expect one of these DNs from in the middle of a pile to recognize somebody's leaving on a pass in order to, in order to help. So you've got three guys covering four if they send out four receivers. So you get great containment coverage, but you lose some pass coverage. Okay, and with the way our high school offense has morphed, we have a lot of teams sending out three and four receivers, so pass coverage has become very important. Okay, but again, if you've got a monster nose tackle, a kid that's just aggressive, okay, and he's he's a nose tackle and can drive everybody back into the quarterback every play, this may be the formation for you. Okay, again, I've never had those big monster kids, so I don't play this formation very often. Okay, a 4-2 defense. So again, this gives great pressure. You've got four guys up on the line. You've got your, um, you've got your out, these outside linebackers or middle linebackers as, as your containment. Okay, you've got some great pressure. Um, it does require these two guys to be absolute studs because they've got a lot of field to cover. Any miss, any guy gets blocked out here, these guys got a lot of field to cover. They're going sideline to sideline a ton. And again, it means two guys are doing all the pass coverage. Okay, I mean, they're only gonna have to cover short passes, but two guys are doing the pass coverage. So it can leave you open to some, some big plays. This is the one most teams in our league run. It is a 2-4 defense. Okay, it's great for pass coverage and some reaction time. It does leave your center open to get to the second level all the time and block one of your linebackers. Okay, Hannah's offense with their pulling guards and their, their big center punished us a lot for, for leaving this guy open. Okay. He got, he got a lot to the second level and caused all sorts of havoc with our linebackers. But he, they had a rarity of a kid that was absolutely massive and fast. And they had an end that would do be like that too. So, But again, this guy's charge of containment, containing the QB. Okay, and you've got four guys playing a zone or man, whatever you choose in behind. Okay, it prevents the big play. It's tough to stop teams you don't get a lot of a lot of plays for losses with this defense though okay but again if you've got lots of fast kind of linebacker body types this is the way you go in fact these guys are basically outside linebackers as well too they're flying around the edge every play if you don't have anything of size and girth this is the defense you go with and for your 12 men guys a safety Okay, so this, this formation we do use, of course, when it's long down in distance, we'll use this. Again, here's the only time that this, this double A gap, expecting this guy to do double A gap is, is allowed, or I, I will tolerate it because it's expecting a lot of that kid to be able to cover two gaps. But if you're third and 15, you're okay with him having to make a play seven, eight yards down the field. And again, guys, these are all about one guy, one gap. Okay? This is the only one because you've got the safety, and here's the weakness. You're giving up. You're giving up a gap, and your guy could get blocked out. 
there's an automatic hole there every time. Um, so again, guys, there's the defense is all about practicing those reps, getting your guys' footwork down, getting them so they can move laterally fast because they've all got a lot of field to cover, and practicing open field tackling. Open field tackling. We, when we do a – I have a drill called make a man miss. My ball carrier has to go through three defensive players, but each defensive player is guarding a 10-yard gap. So they've they're, my guys aren't allowed to run their defensive player over. It's all about trying to pick up a guy and tackle in space. And we practice that a lot because, as you can see, your defensive players have to tackle in space a lot. One missed tackle by somebody guarding a C-gap, and that play's gone a long ways. But again, your offense has a chance to score back, so it's, it's not, the game is not over. It's one of the nice things about six-man football. The kids get a lot of reps, a lot of reps. Six-man football tends to have more plays in a game than 12-man. So they get a lot of reps, a lot of opportunities to learn something, try it again next play. Learn something, try it again next play. Again, it's a great way to learn the game. I love the fact that Edmonton's gone to six-man football for their Adam because the kids are learning a wide variety of skills. They're learning football in general, and they're getting really good. It's a, it's a great game for high school because you can get as detailed and, and as, as – crazy about it as you'd like as hard as your kids will go my kids are absolutely psychotic about it so they keep they keep wanting to learn more wanting to learn more in fact a couple of them are watching this presentation today so it's it's a great game guys if you're looking to get into football coaching adam it's it's a lot of fun it's a great great game if you're a 12 man guy looking to keep a program alive please consider this rather than folding a program. It's a great game, and you'll have a lot of fun coaching it. Okay, there's my email address, guys. Taylor has my all my contacts if anybody has any more questions. I love talking football, love talking six-man football. I will be very happy to, to text and email and chat and share everything I have with anybody that wants it. So... Yeah, well, thank you very much, Corey. Uh, we're not done. I'm sure there's going to be some questions. I have a couple for you. So um, I guess before everybody takes off, they're just in the chat there. You know, we've talked about the restrictions in Alberta and the board of directors and the administration staff of Football Alberta are currently drafting up plans for what the future may look like this July, August, September, October. Um, one of the scenarios on the table right now, and uh, you know, I don't really want anybody to take this the wrong way and, and go take it to your local organizations or your parents or players. But we may be in a situation where we are only allowed to play six aside football because our limitations are um, our limitations are 50 person mass gatherings. Right. So my daughter just walked in. That's fine. Very fine. Um, so that means we can't play 12 aside football. So if we want any sort of football, we have to keep our mass gatherings below 50. This would mean parents would simply drop their kids off at practice and we'd have uh, six aside practices or games, no spectators. Like this is worst case scenario, I'm saying. Um, you know, like you said, we might not be able to touch each other. New Brunswick, BC have said there's no contact sports allowed until there's a vaccine. So there's a lot of different options, including, um, you know, high school, Bantam, Peewee modifying for a season and playing six aside. So what does that mean at your high school or what does that mean? at your Bantam program when you have 35 or 40 players, well, you might make two teams and, and that's okay. The goal here during these times is to look at all of our scenarios, all of our situations and maybe six aside football for two months is a lot better than no football. I'll tell you that right now. And, and Corey will say it'll be a great option. Yeah. So, um, it's better than nothing. So yes, to answer your questions, if we're in a situation where they say, yeah, you can play football. Sure. But no mass gatherings, no games nothing about 50 people. Well, we will explore that. And I know it is an option. We have a board meeting on Monday night. One of the options is uh, strictly six aside football or simply skills and drills. Like this fall might be just all about development and skills and drills. And no like Rob said, no touching, no contact. That's, I would say, worst case scenario of, uh, is no football. And then there could be a situation where 
we're only allowed to practice and we're not allowed to be within six feet of each other and we're just trying to get better in skills and drills. Beat it. So if there's any other questions, you can text. Jack, can you? Uh, you can write it in the chat. You can just pop up your screen and, and talk to Corey. Or I know he gave some of his plays away to Hannah, who seems to beat him every single year. So just more advice and, and easier for Hannah. If they want to come on and uh, chirp him a little bit, that's fine too. But <laughs> at this point, it's kind of uh, an open forum. This was recorded. Uh, Corey will PDF his presentation and send it to me, please. And uh, I'll put it on the Google Drive for everybody to see. So if we are in a situation come September that we're only playing six aside, we'll probably bring Corey and some of his really good league contacts up to do another Zoom presentation to uh, all the programs in Alberta who are now, you know, maybe modifying to six aside. So. Sorry, I just had to spaz at my kids. Um, <laughs> Corey, can you see that? Does your QB have freedom to audible in any of your series? And if so, uh, what are they? Someone wants your audibles, which is fine. Too. <laughs> did you hear that, Corey? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I'm just. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, not really. Like the last two years, my they're on the film. There, my quarterback for the most part was in grade ten. And I got him just to run this year. He's in grade 12. So we are working on giving him a chance to kind of not audible into a new play, but just if he sees a mismatch to change one guy's role. Like if he sees a mismatch as far as our guy's really on a go route, he's going to be faster to change the route he's doing and just go. So that's what we're kind of working on with him. I don't, don't really have an audible how to audible out of the play, no. Do I script my plays? Yes, the first 15 are always scripted. And I have a red zone set that I always follow. And I have we have a no huddle kind of two minute offense too that I send in with just hand signals that the kids all have the plays memorized. You don't have to give all your secrets away to your opposition. <laughs> Cam, those guys have, have everything I do on film like two, two dozen times we play each other so much so there can't be much he doesn't know already. So any questions at all for Corey, once again, uh, throw them in the chat. If not, uh, you pop your video on. If not, uh, we'll wrap it up in a, in a few moments here. Someone did have a question earlier I said I was going to get back to. I think we dealt with it. There is a text Again, if anybody wants to talk to me later, they have specific questions about playbook or want, I have several playbooks and, and like I didn't show the nine different um, evolutions of series three that I've tried. So I've got all different things that I've tried, so. Yeah, and one of the questions was kind of the difference for the, the Adam rules that we have in Alberta. So I don't know if, uh, like, Sylvan's still on here, or anybody who coached Adam this past year. Tim looks like he's here. Uh, if you want to pop on and talk about what are some, you know, differences. We won't get into great detail in terms of Adam football this time, because Tim will at the end of the month. But one of the questions was, what are some of the, the rule differences with, currently with Adam? Uh, it says, explain how you decide run plays for the second half, the tracking and the success. How I just, well, I basically, I've got an assistant coach that keeps track of everything I call in the first half, and we go back to whatever's working. I mean, I, I find I, personally, I, I've been using this kind of COVID isolation to go through my own play calling, and I find I don't call our base plays enough. And so I, I get, I jump too quickly to the, to the reverses, to the off-field stuff. I need to stick with our basics a little more, but. How about this question in terms of probably like an ineligible blocker downfield. So your center, not necessarily the guy who snaps the ball, but your center yeah. lineman who's ineligible yeah. from what I understand. Uh, yeah. Can he go down the field and downfield block? On a run play. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Like on, on, on my series one, if I'm running that sweep, my center is heading to the play side middle linebacker every time. 
Yeah, but if it's a pass, it's the same rules as 12 side? Same, same as 12 men. You can't cross the line of scrimmage, yeah. So, again, defense, we, we spend a lot of time teaching our, our linebackers to read that ineligible receiver, whoever he is, and read what his feet are doing. Yep. Same as you would for a middle linebacker reading the guards um, in 12 men. There's a question about field sizes at different ages. Yeah, like I think Adam um, in Edmonton, they run essentially like four fields with flies. Uh, and they just play strictly with wise fields. It's Adam football, so it's a lot uh, uh, skinnier. The width isn't as long, and, and obviously the length isn't either. But another good question for six aside, do you have specific tips or drills for special teams to help players adjust to the six-man game? Um, I wouldn't call them special drills. I mean, we just, we just practice it. I practice it three times a week. I have, I have a special teams period where we practice the different events, and I – I do it just like in a game. So they all line up on the sidelines and I'll call kickoff. They run on and we run it and we practice their lanes the same way 12 men does. I mark them down on pylons, run, come down your lanes. Um, my team, I mean, everybody knows this. I don't punt. I haven't punted in a decade. Love it. Because the, the, t the number of times I have a punter that can kick the ball far enough, I might as well, if I'm third and 15, I may only get it two yards past the first down marker anyway, so I might as well try to take a shot at getting a first down. It works better for me anyway. So I have one kid every year that claims he's the team punter because he knows he'll never have to do it. That's great. Um, yeah, so in terms of um, the Adam game and, and how it's a little bit different in the Edmonton area and, and Calgary does it different as well, we'll chat more about that at the end of May. Um, Tim Anger, our executive director, has coached all levels the past 30 years, uh, nationally, locally, high school, Bantam, and uh, he ventured into coaching Adam oh, four years ago, and he, I think he coached three years of it with his son, and uh, he had a lot of fun, he had a lot of challenges, and he's going to talk about the successes he's had and the differences, and the way they ran their practices and their games, and that is on uh, May 28th, so yeah, we'll probably leave it there. Um, unless someone jumps on last second here. And I like what uh, Cam said, um, six man ball is better than no ball. So I agree. Uh, or no, I think it was Mike said six man would definitely be better than no man. So I agree with that. And we will figure out through these challenging times and we'll probably have a little bit of a football Alberta announcement uh, next week sometime following our board meeting. Some of the decisions that uh, we at least discuss um, that's about it. We will leave it there and everybody have a great night. Thank you very much.